It's so let's go ahead with uh, Simon's presentation. So Simon, thank you so much for joining us. Simon Weebel is with Drone Amplified Incorporated, and he's going to give us a demonstration uh, with about Ignis, the ping pong dropping drone that is revolutionizing the prescribed fire world. Uh, take it away, Simon. That sounds like an awesome intro. Um, so my name is Simon Weibel. I work with Drone Amplified. Um, basically, we're the company behind the Ignis PSD machine that's built to work with UAS systems. Um, usually, we do these demos in person in the field, um, but we'll do the best we can online. So I'll just go through a little bit of a PowerPoint and overview of our system. And then I'll show you a quick three minute video of it in action with the Lakeview Hotshots um, doing an actual burn. And then I'll just show you a quick snippet of it doing a nighttime operation with the IR camera. And then we'll kind of open it up for questions. So stand by with me if this takes me just a moment. All right, so here's our awesome photo. This was taken at the Pine Gulch fire. Um, it's kind of like, you might've gotten a postcard from us, I'm not sure. So we'll do a quick system overview. So the Ignis system is, weighs about two kilograms empty. It's four kilograms fully loaded. That's with the balls and the glycol. Um, and it does have its own power source, which is a 7.2 LiPo battery. Um, one of the main things is the system is a two-part system. So we have the hopper that holds the balls, um, the brains, everything with that. And then we have a dropper and that's what actually, um, that's what actually does the uh, puncturing and dropping of the balls. Why it detaches if there is a hang fire. Um, I don't know if you can see in the bottom there, the tubes that bring the glycol into the needles are steel reinforced and they will actually, if there's a hang fire, you can release the dropper and it'll hang and it'll just burn out the PSD, bring it back, clean it out and reattach and you can start ignitions again. Um, so we use the standard dragon eggs from SEI. They're an inch in diameter, the same eggs that go through the red dragon. Originally, we designed the system to hold 400 balls, but as we're all in fire, we found that we could push it to 450 balls. Um, with that, we can drop full tilt 120 spheres a minute. And then there's a two to five minute uh, reload turnaround time. Um, be a little more depending on where you're landing, what you have going on. But that basically is switching out the batteries and refilling the hopper and you're off and away. Um, one of the big things is people always ask about how much time can this spend in the sky? We're looking at about fully loaded 18 minutes of flight time. Um, however, with a generator and enough batteries, oh, sorry. With the generator and enough batteries, um, you can keep rotating the batteries and you can actually keep the Ignis system running missions nonstop for the duration of your burn or firing operation. So really just a matter of switching batteries out and reloading, it's good to go. Um, one of the awesome features of using the Ignis, especially with the X-T2 camera, is that you have both thermal imaging and visual capabilities for your camera. So this allows for low visibility, smoky conditions, and also night operations burning at night. And we'll see a video of that in a little bit. Currently, the UAS platform that we use right now is the DJI Matrice 600 Pro. Um, obviously, we can get into it at, towards the end of the presentation in the questions, but there has been some drama around Chinese-made drones this year. and so that being said, we highly integrate with whatever UAS system we're working with. We have our own flight app that controls flight, um, firing operations, and 
mapping everything from there. Currently, we have a contract with the U.S. Forest Service, and that is to look for domestic options as another platform. So we are looking at both having the DJI platform for certain partners and cooperators and the ability to have a completely American-made option on the table. And we can get into that in a little bit. Um, M600, its capabilities is very versatile machine, very easy to use, easy to fly. Uh, max speed is 40 miles per hour. The max takeoff weight, so that's, you know, if you really load it, batteries, camera, everything is gonna be about 15 kilograms. Max payload is six kilograms. So the Ignis comes in just under that at the four kilogram mark. And that allows for optimal flight times of 16 to 38 minutes. And there's a variation, you know, running PSD missions from a drone, you know, we start with a lot of weight and we drop a lot of weight very fast or not quite that fast. So there's the fluctuation in how much time you can spend up in the sky. So the Ignis hardware is one half of our offering. The other half is our Ignis flight app. So we've it slowly evolved with the system to become a sort of catch all for forestry and wildfire drone operations. So with this app, currently you can fly any of the DJI line of drones with the flight app. So if you are currently using a Mavic or a Mavic 2 or Mavic Enterprise Dual, you can actually use our app for free and download it um, off the Android store. And through this app, um, you can just fly, you can do automated missions, and you can also do uh, uh, ignitions, obviously. And through that, it's, we're also be, you know, on the path to creating more and more options. So it currently has a GPX ability to overlay GPX. Um, you can plan ignitions. We have both uh, automated and manual flying capabilities. So you can fly it completely manual or you can uh, automate the whole process from takeoff to mission for everything from just flying and taking pictures, mapping and ignitions. Um, how we work is you can use our sort of base interface, it's a uh, map box, so it's sort of the same as Google Earth, but there's gonna be you know, slight differences. Generally in operations, what we do is we download and integrate uh, any geo-reference PDF and KMV files, and these we can toggle on and off as overlays. So if you're on a wildfire, you can take your, basically just download the operations map, and you can overlay that and you're flying off the same map that everyone's seeing. Um, when I, I deployed to a fire this summer and we actually used it in the truck to navigate. So it can be incredibly powerful and helpful and easy to use. Um, when we do ignition, so it's basically configured to spacing. So if you're looking at a tighter, you know, tighter drop spacing, you can set it to one foot, five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. And the uh, Ignis will drop a ball at that um, increment automatically, whether you speed up, slow down, turn, go up, you know, it, it'll run the calculations. And even during manual flight, you'll get the spacing that you set. And it's accurate within, you know, just depending on environmental factors, a foot or two. Um, you know, anywhere from 50 to 200 acres in a single flight, we're seeing some of our federal partners getting 2,000 acres a day with a small team of holders and a one or two Ignis operating, and it's affordable. You know, outside of the initial investment, you're really just paying for the dragon eggs and a little glycol, some fuel for your generator, and then uh, your personnel. So one of the newest things that we've integrated is automated mapping and we do this, it's, everything's touch screen. And this is something I can get into more sort of if people are interested in using our app. But uh, it automates, once you set up your transect region, it automates everything from picture the camera to 
when it takes photos to everything. You just set your overlaps and time between photos and it will do the rest. So I've used it a couple of times and it's awesome. So we'll just get into this. And then if there's more questions at the end, um, please ask them and I can answer them to the best of my ability. But you know, some of the things, there is a uh, problem. There's a choke point with training. So there are two courses in order to fly on federal fires and federal uh, ground. One is the A450, which basically cards you as a pilot, and that enables you to fly for um, sort of non-fire reasons on federal land. The next is the S373, so that's the NWCG position um, class and then task book, and that allows you to become a UASP, and that's like a position within the whole you know, fire world. And right now, I mean, I think the Forest Service only has 10 qualified pilots. Um, and the last three years, this year included, classes have been canceled for a variety of reasons. And this year it's COVID and I'm, a couple other things. So that's something we're working on with the Forest Service and uh, hoping to find a solution to, but that makes it difficult for cooperators to sort of go between their land and federal land. Um, there's been a push and, you know, the Made in America, the anti-drone legislation that came down, uh, it started with the DOI Secretarial Order 3379, and that basically halted the drone program for the Department of Interior. And that circled around many topics. One of them was data security, um, using Chinese drones, and everything in between. Um, and then the National Defense Authorization Act had a lot of language that was um, sort of anti-drone, but also just really harsh on where drone products could come from, what parts, you know, it, it was gonna bottle sort of just stop the drone industry. And a lot of that language was removed. So we have a little bit more runway now um, to use the DJI products and a little more time to help develop domestic drone manufacturing that can compete. And so there's a big push for Made in America, uh, less by design and more just because we're a small company. The Ignis, everything is made in America. So we're, not too worried about it. It's just me to find the right platform to carry it. And so if we have questions, we can do that after. But let's see about showing some operational videos. So this is a video taken by the Lakeview Hotshots and it's gonna show ignitions from the point of view of the drone and then sort of the burn from the point of view of the drone and then the angle from the pilot's point of view. And please let me know if it's not showing up. But so here they're gonna start dropping. This is a great example of the Ignis being used. Um, you can see there's a river on the left side of the drone and railroad tracks. The main fire is up on the ridge top on the right. The pilot and everyone else is on the other side of the river. And there was not really another option for burning this piece of land because safety concerns for putting burners in with the river on one side and the fire on the other. Um, that you can see, this is the ignis dropping, um, flying. And now this is the same flight, but coming back to scout the line. So there's the main fire's edge. And you can see the ignitions. Um, that the pilot did. And basically with this one, with the river and everything, they just lit a head fire and let it come together. If you didn't have um, the river in such a hard fuel break, one of the advantages of the Ignis is that you could tie in with the main fire and walk that fire all the way down to the fuel break. And, you know, get really good fire coming down that you're controlling and suck all that smoke and heat up with it.
And so we can see the fires coming together. It all worked out pretty well for them. Um, one of the awesome things is being able to ignite and then also see what your fire is doing seamlessly. Um, you know, you don't have to guess what it's doing on the other side of the ridge or where it's coming together. You know, your pilot can be showing it. Um, a lot of times, drone teams will bring a Bluetooth TV with them and you can connect to the controller so that everyone in the in the you know area can watch the TV and see what's going on and the pilot can be flying and it just adds for you know overall situational awareness. Um, so you can see where the pilot is here on the left. And then there's the burn. We'll switch over here. There it is from the pilot's location. And then I'll just show you a quick clip. This is the Klondike fire. Um, this is some OAS testing and dropping at night. So we can just see the same system, same camera with the IR capability. And so you can you can do the same missions at night as you are during the day, and there's no difference. And one of the beautiful things with using drones like this is you also see where the fire is doing, but post fire, finding hot spots and directing resources, um, take, you know, operationally makes up about 80% of what you do is the scouting and the mapping and, you know, Overwatch. So I guess now let's open up to some questions. All right, thanks so much, Simon. Are there any questions for Simon? And feel free to unmute yourselves and turn your video on if you'd like to ask Simon a question that way instead of using the chat box. Let's see one. Yeah, hey, this is Don and Doug here in Socorro. Are you guys out for contract and, and what's kind of the, the price of your your module? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I went out with actually on a fire, but that was with one of our clients. They were short a pilot and that was kind of a special arrangement. Um, you know, we haven't got into the contracting business. I know I've talked with probably a few people on this call and others of being able to do burns. And that's kind of a question, that's a conversation we could have. I know we're capable of doing it, at least not, I mean, on non-federal land. So, I mean, we could, yeah, we could talk about that because it could be, something like a contract where two of us that our pilots could come out and do burning, or it could be a demo type of deal, depending on the size of the burn and what it's going to take. So, so now your operation is totally with the Forest Service or any federal interior or agriculture? No. So there, once you get into federal land, we're, we're running into the problem of how they've built the program. Is it Drones are kind of carted almost the same as uh, cooperator helicopters. So you need to have the certain drone carted and then you need to have a pilot that has the courses and finish the task book. And then from there, you can become a contract resource. That hasn't been done yet for the IGNIS. So all of the federal um, burning is done through the federal system. And for them, we just sell them the systems and they go use them in the field. When I was on the Slater fire, we were working solely on state and private land. And there was another team that did burning on the federal land. So there was a hard stop there whenever we crossed jurisdictional borders. So it's kind of like the Wild West. A lot of the stuff isn't 100% figured out, but there's always ways to, ways to find, you know, pass through it. We had a question in the chat box. 
Have you used this to map monitor hand ignitions, i.e. those where the drone is not lighting but flying above a crew? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I would say that even with the federal crews, 80% of what they do as a mission is monitoring situational awareness, uh, mapping, all those things. Um, when I was deployed to the Slater fire, we actually did zero ignitions, but a lot of it was overwatch for crews that were operating in very smoky conditions. So they had zero air resources um, and really an inability to see the fire behavior or even where it was. So we were flying about 10 to 16 hours a day of overwatch flights to show everyone what the fire was doing, where it was doing it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, yeah, a, apart from the Ignis Ignition, with, with the Ignis app, you're able to do a lot of that stuff seamlessly. Hey, Sam, this is Doug. Thanks for your presentation. Um, two questions. Like one of those, what are those white spheres on top? It looks like they're on uh, the Ignis. And then also you said something about everything's made in the USA, but but still there was the issue with China. So I guess, can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, I actually have the drone right here. Um, so if you can see from the top, they almost look, can look like a coffee cup sitting on top of the drone. But what it is, is it's three GPS antennas. And it's one, it's redundancy. If one fails, you can still get back. But also with uh, the M600 and most DJI drones, they help it stay in its position. So if you, when we take off with this, we can let go of the controls and the drone will stay exactly where it's supposed to be. So it'll, even in really high winds, it'll try and auto correct to put it back in the spot where you left it. So you can put it up and really just mess with the camera, look around and not worry about, you know, trying to keep the drone level. So it's almost, it's a part of its auto flight deal. Um, and that's all through the A3 flight controller. And so the, the China deal, that's one of the bigger issues in the drone industry as a whole, and especially with like our federal and Department of Defense partners, um, so the Ignis itself, so at our company, we just make the Ignis payload and design the flight app. The, the drone, which is the M600, which the Ignis here is attached to, it's a DJI drone and it's made in China. So um, there, that's where the security concerns came in. So as you know, we work very closely with DJI and we de developed a government edition of the M600 and a government edition of our app. And what they do is they basically hard wall the flight parts of the app from the internet. So, you, so we built in this extra level of security and that really didn't matter. Um, now with the Defense Authorization Act dropping a lot of the language that was proposed, it does matter again, and they're going to be able to use the government edition DJI drones for the foreseeable future. Um, however, there's some hesitancy because building a program with these drones could leave it open to another shutdown, you know, in the next four years or two years or eight years, where they have a program built around a fleet of DJI drones and then suddenly new legislators passed that ends the program. So as a company, we have a contract with the Forest Service and part of that contract is finding an alternative that, that's American made that fits that language that was in the National Defense Authorization Act. So it's kind of a gray area. There's not like a real concrete answer, but that's sort of where it is. It's, it's finding a domestic source for the same drone basically. And with that are the issues of um, cost. So the, the DJI products are the best on the market and the cheapest. And once when we start going into American made, we're seeing a, a five time increase in the price. So, and not quite the same capabilities. 
So that that's part of the problem that we're working on here to make it to kind of move the domestic market forward. Hopefully that answered your question in a roundabout way. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Thanks, Seven. That was great. Simon, we had another question. Uh, what's a rough cost estimate it would cost an agency um, cost an agency to get this equipment and personnel trained to operate this technology? Absolutely, yep. And none of our prices are hidden or shifty. Uh, so we basically, we price the Ignis Hopper. That's what we build. That's what we make. Um, and then we can either source the DJI products for the agency or they can find the best price. Uh, we're not a DJI distributor, so we go off the best best market price we can find and we add, I think, 5% just for time and shipping. So with the DJI system and the X-T2 camera, which is the, the IR and visual and three sets of the batteries, so the system uses six smart batteries. We're looking at a price that's under 50 grand. So generally it's in the 49,000 range for the complete setup. That's tablet, controller, everything to go fly and burn the next day. So that's all up cost. And then there is little to no maintenance on that. So. It's kind of one of those initial investments, and then then you're just paying, you know you kind of spread that over how many burns and acres you're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great things about the drone also is that there's always the question of crashing. Unless you're, we've had one crash into a fire um, and was total loss, but generally you can these can withstand a pretty severe crash because every part of it's modular. So I had a client that completely flipped the drone and looked like it was totaled and it only the cost was about $210 to get it back to normal. So, mm -hmm. and nobody gets hurt. And nobody gets hurt, that's a nice feature. Uh, Simon, what is the cost? Do you know what the cost is for the training courses that are required and then how much time does it take to get somebody through that if the courses are available? And I understand you said that's a limiting factor in and of itself, but if they're available, how long do those courses take? Absolutely, so there's, there's, the, there's the FAA courses, there's the federal courses, and then there's like the courses that we can do. So the FAA, you need a part 107. Um, it's really easy to get. It costs about $99. And it, it's like a hoop to jump through. Um, there's great, you know, great stuff on YouTube to study it. That's basically, that's like your entry level commercial drone pilot card. Uh, as a company, we had to find our own sort of waiver for basically dropping hazardous material from uh, a drone platform. So we modified a crop duster waiver. So it's basically a part 137. And that's something that we pioneered and we can help an agency get through. And also as that agency is going through that process, they can operate under ours. Once you have the part 137, you you can, as an agency organization, then certify your own pilots for life. So it's basically, once you have it, every new pilot can get certified through the agency's part 137. And it, I mean, it's uh, basically a 30 minute conversation. And so those are the F two FAA uh, sort of trainings and certifications you need to do the ignitions. Um, the A450 and S373, um, as they were designed, they're both a week-long course. I couldn't really talk about the cost, but I, I would assume it's very similar to any NWCG course that's a week long. So $500 to $800, somewhere in that range, but that would be like a educated guess. Um, and so those are each a week long. There's 
talk because they've had such a hard time of scheduling it, especially with COVID, of moving that to the field. So it would be more of a job aid. Um, and I don't know if that's better or worse for cooperators. I think we'll, we'll have to kind of see and look where that goes. Um, in terms of ignition, so that was in the workshop phase in, as being certified as a, you know, UASP with ignition capabilities. I think they designed that to be an add-on course. Um, however, I have been doing most of the payload courses. So I'll, I'll train the pilot in the payload and they'll go out in the field and they have like a workshop task book sort of deal. Um, and that's all federal. As, as a company, we offer a one day, two day training course for, I think it's right around a thousand. So let's say if, if you purchase a complete system or just the Ignis and you want it, I would come to your location and train, you know, 10 of your people on how to fly the drone and use the system. 10 is a magic number. It could be more, it could be less, but you know, whoever wants to get trained up, we can generally do it in a day and get the hang of it. You know, it's, it's meant to be really intuitive, easy to learn and easy to operate. And so that would be sort of the, the different pathways. I, I don't have any concrete answers and I don't think anyone does on the federal sort of classes. There's just, there's so much flux going on right now with that program, but Hopefully that's, that's kind of a guide of where it's headed. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Simon. Uh, we have another question in the chat. How far apart does the drone try to land each ball? And uh, I imagine a short discussion on how that's adjusted uh, would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's two ways that the system operates dropping a ball. Um, one, there's a seven second minimum drop increment. So every seven seconds, it's going to drop a ball. You can you can raise that as high as you want to a certain point. Um, but what what that means is it, it just keeps the system moving and keeps the operator alert that it's that you're still dropping. Um, you know that's so that you're keeping the mindset of you know you stop look around for a minute or so and you're not going to fly off and leave a trail of balls on your way to go do whatever you're doing. Um, but generally the drop pattern is set within the app and that's set at a spacing that you're looking at creating. So it's basically it runs an algorithm through the computer and matches up that spacing with speed, um, turns, any, any input changes that you put in. The system, like if you have it set for 20 feet apart, the system will hit it at 20 feet. It'll release the ball. There's, there could be a, there's a foot or two difference, just depending on how fast you're going, wind speed, terrain, altitude, but it's releasing the ball accurately at that interval. So you can, you can set it to be 20 feet and do an ignition line and then set it for 10 feet, do the ignition line, set it back for 20 feet. Um, a lot of times on wildfires when they're burning, they just set it at one foot and just, you know, are going 40 miles per hour and pumping 120 balls out a minute. And that's what they're doing, you know, prescribed fire. You can set up an automated mission that's gentle and 20 feet here, 10 feet there, and, you know, creating the fire effects that you want that, that way. Great. Thanks, Simon. Are there any other questions? Okay, we got another one here. Uh, what's the average lifespan for the entire system, drone, hopper, camera, batteries, etc.? Is it like any new tech, six months after purchase, there's a new version? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, so, a year ago, I'd probably say, look out for the next version of the Ignis. Um, however, the Ignis that's on here, that's the, call it the Ignis 2. It's actually the second generation Ignis and it's the final Ignis at this size. Um, 
any updates that would happen or any modifications um as a company we always offer those updates so if if you bought this one and it's the dji variant and it works with the dji drone but say you want to upgrade to the next platform that came out we we have we would be able to offer like a cheap upgrade to like make it work for that drone so it's not going to we're not coming out with the Ignis 3 next year and then the Ignis 3X, you know, three months after that. Um, the biggest, I guess the biggest concern there is the drone technology evolving quickly and moving fast. Um, most of the changes are to the flight app and those are just updates and they, you know, you, like any app, you just update it and the new features are there. Um, there will be some features of the app that are paid features, but there will always be a version of the app that's free to do ignitions and flights with. So most of, you know, the DOI has ignitions that are two years old and they're still working just fine. Um, as a company, generally, if there's an issue or something breaks, they send them to us and we fix it. Every I've I've built an Ignis from scratch, and if I can build it, anyone can work with it. Um, that means that if something breaks in the field, there's three different screws and three different tools, and you can pull it off and fix it. So we've had reservoirs crack where the um, fly coal is stored, and you're able to swap that out in the field really easily. You know, so it's built to last. It's built to be rugged. And the, I would say that the thing to look out for is what's going to carry the drone. And a lot of that's advances in technology. And a lot of that's the uncertainty around what platforms are going to be able to be used and what platforms aren't going to be able to use. And that kind of circles back to the, the China problem that we've had this year and seeing where that's moving in the future. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right, we're giving folks just a second to think about it. I just want to say thank you, Simon, for a fantastic presentation. It's been uh, really interesting to hear that and to see those videos. Um, not seeing any other questions in the chat or hearing anybody speak up, I think uh, we'll call that a wrap and thank you so much. Awesome. And if anyone has questions, you can email me directly or give me a call. I'm always available. So great. Thank you. Simon, would you? Emily, mind gonna... Yeah. Dave, is that you? Yeah, I was just going to. Hey, Simon, Dave Lasky from the Forest Series Guild. Good to see you. I just wanted How to doing, Dave? answer maybe the other half of, of the question that Simon was asked. So we've been working with Simon trying to figure out what it would look like to stand up a drone module um, in, in, in partnership. And so we've mapped out that we think it's probably a month of training in total for one person. Um, and that probably it would take two years to complete. And obviously the probability, the probable, probable part is as Simon was saying, some of these trainings are not currently very easily available. Um, but when we looked at moving through task books and everything else. Um, with a month of training per person, we wanted to have two people trained, so there was some redundancy. Um, and when we looked at payroll, travel, lodging, all that good stuff, um, and then probably some add-on things like a generator and a, you know some things to go with the $50,000 drone package, we came up with probably another $50,000 in, in actual costs to truly get a module in the field. Um, you know, there's an asterisk there because it, it's yet to be seen, but, and obviously I guess a little dependent on your agency's payroll, um, but that's what we estimated was that it was probably $100,000 just to magic wand your way into a drone program. Yeah. And I guess another thing to add, as a company, we like to have 
people that have flown the drone before so that when you're flying it's not your first time flying and igniting so we like to see pilots with 20 hours of flight time um that's not a hard number and it's not real hard to get there but that, that could be i guess a, a standard to look at Great. Thanks to you both. Uh, Simon, would you mind putting your email address in the chat box in case folks want to follow up with you and uh, they can do that easily? Absolutely. And a big part of my job is doing live fire demonstrations. And so, whoops, I think I sent that privately to Tim. How do you, oh, there it is. And if you're interested in doing a burn burn, we, we can work on that too. So if you'd like to have the Ignis there, we can figure out a cost-effective way to make that a reality. We like to get out in the field as much as possible. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Oops, let me put my number in one more time. There it is. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for a, a great virtual field trip for our annual meeting. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Hopefully I'll hear from some of you.